and Karibuni to expulsion at 50. My name is Dola Vasani. During my recent visit to Uganda, I had the unique opportunity to meet with Sudhir Ruparelia, the chairman and CEO of the Ruparelia Group, a privately owned conglomerate in Uganda. The Ruparelia Group are involved in over 25 businesses in various sectors, including property development and management, insurance, hospitality, education, media, and floriculture. I hope you find Sudhir's story interesting and inspiring. We're four generations in, 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 in Uganda. My father was born here, I was born here, my father's grandfather came to Uganda, and my, my children are born here. They, they came to Mombasa in 1897. They're five brothers. They reached Uganda in 1903. My father was born here in 32, I'm born here in 56. My son born here in 1990. So in 72, we didn't know anything other than Uganda. When the famous Idi Amin, uh, General Idi Amin, the president of Uganda, announced that he's expelling Asians. First, it, nobody took it seriously. Then as the deadline came, everybody knew this is serious. And uh, from our point of view, we didn't know um, what to expect because we were all studying. I was only 17 years old. I was I, I was Ugandan citizen. Okay. However, my parents were British citizens so we all had to they all left I was of, of, of two minds whether to go or not to go in the end I decided to go as well uh, uh, probably I left on the last day of the deadline which is 5th November yeah. 1972 Originally, we are from uh, from the west of the country called a town called Kabatoro, which is in the Toro district, in the middle of the game park. Well, I think I grew in the middle of the game park, so my passion has always been uh, wildlife preservation, uh, enjoying the wildlife. And it was a kind of a free life. Our education was, like many young ones, you know, quite an important part of our life. So we had to be in a boarding school. I was in a boarding school from the age of six. And for education, we had to stay in a boarding school in Kampala. But you, then you would go home on weekends or something? No weekends. You, you go home every three months. Because uh, where we stayed was about 300 miles away. So it's like an eight hour journey by road in those days, because of the roads and everything. So, but you, what was your father doing then? My father had a, a, a retail business, okay. he's running a, a shop, a, a, a couple of businesses there and a petrol station and things like that. Mm. But you were there, were there many Indians then? Very few Indians there, only about seven, eight families. So my parents probably, do you remember like what they were thinking? I guess, you know, nobody knew what the next okay. was going to happen. Mm. There are few incidents where few people were killed, mm. so there's a big panic. And I, I guess a lot of people were just glad to get out of here. It's a common experience that people yeah. have shared, yeah. So, okay, so you stayed behind and you were like in two minds and then you went on in, at the end of... My parents left within the first 30 days. I was uh, all alone um, with some of my friends. I was of two minds whether to stay. I wanted to stay, but then I think things started getting to a level where I was still not independent as far as my living was concerned. I didn't know what the next step was. The last minute I decided to leave and ended up in UK. And, I, and that must have been a, in, yeah, quite a difficult journey, I would have thought, you know, getting on the plane. And When you're 17 years old and you, 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 you are, you're getting onto the plane first time, the only thing we knew about England was watching movies where uh, a detective is, is standing out in the cold under a, a lamppost, 
keeping an eye on these uh, potential gangsters, you know. None of us even bothered to think about it because all we wanted to do was to get reach the destination. So you arrived in Stansted? I arrived in Heathrow and we were bused at 3 o'clock in the morning down to Greenham Common. Very, very popular and a, and a very large um, RF uh, mm. camps or barracks, what you want to call it. And how long did you stay there? Just one night. Next morning, other people from Uganda were in the same camp. And somebody told me he's going to London. So I asked him if he could help me. I wanted to get to Finchley, where my aunties were. The guy was very helpful and he actually came to London and then and came with me up to Finchley, dropped me and then he... Mm. So it was quite an amazing thing, you know. And then I stayed in Finchley for a little while, a week or ten days. You can imagine about seven people living in a two-bedroom apartment there. And then I eventually dressed my parents. I went to join them in Skantop. Skantop was basically a steel city. I was not very sure what to do, so I decided to take a route and travel around England to see where I want to settle. To Birmingham, Manchester, Stockport, Macclesfield, and ended up in my Massa's house and stayed there for a week, uh, for a few weeks. And from there, we end up in Ilford and, and, you know, looking for a job. Eventually, with Ilford, I worked there for two, three months and then moved to, again, to Finchley. Got a few jobs here and there, uh, you know, working in supermarkets, filling up shelves, and then, and then sort of uh, settled in Finchley at, at that time. So when you were here, was there something that you had in mind that you would like to do when you were growing up here? Did you think, oh yeah, I'd like no, to do actually, this, I'd like to do that? <laughs> By the time I left, I, I was doing senior three, mm -hmm. S3 in those, uh, what you want to call, a third year in the secondary. So, you know, we not even reach where uh, our career would begin or end up, or even had time to think about it, because you're just in the middle of prime age for education is when you uprooted. So there's no plan to think of, you know. Mm. And in those days, we never had uh, what you call career guidance and all that. Yeah? It's now, now it's different. Yeah? You ended up in England and you tried your hand at different things, different jobs. To well, I didn't so. try. I, I had to earn a living to support myself. I had to pay my bed sitters, I had to pay for my transport, I had to, mm. you know, for my food. So it, job was not a choice, it was a necessity. While I was in London, I worked in a bakery, butchery, um, supermarkets and factories, you know, and in the end I ended up also at weekends, well, I would have a job in the weekdays, a night job, then I would have drive, uh, you know, mini cabs, which is taxis, and also go to school in, in, in the daytime. So I did my O and my A levels in England. Mm. I bought my first house in England when I was 21 years old. Worked, uh, used to do two jobs and here, save money here, here and there and... No, know, but my parents, what, what, what did they end up doing? My parents uh, remained in Skantop. My, my father was working in the steel mill there. And my brothers and my sister were all growing up. Okay, so let's fast forward, you know, to 1985 and then you come back. And I was wondering, like, what was the turning point? What was the motivation to return? Had you been <clears> thinking about it for a while? Or? My, my, my uncle was always in Uganda. He never left. So always would come back, uh, come to, Uganda, uh, to England and visit. And, of course, you, you know, you talk about it. So Uganda never left us and we never left Uganda. So, and, and it's like, uh, uh, you know, Africa is either in your blood, or it is not in your blood. And definitely, I was missing something in my life. So in 85, I decided to come to Africa, that's it. And were you on your own? Or? I was on my own, my wife was in England. Oh, you had already ma got married? I got married in 77. I was 21, she was 20. And what did she think? Is she also from East Africa? Yeah, fortunately, she was also ex-Ugandan. Uh, we met in England, got married. Of course, my wife came from a very um, conservative family. Here, she had a boyfriend, 
who was wild and uh, with long hair and uh, driving a minicab. So her parents did not approve of me. However, she stuck to me and uh, the rest is all <laughs> history. That's a lovely story. Okay, so you come, you decide that uh, you have uh, your uncle here and you de decide to come in 85. How was it? <laughs> in those days, Uganda was like a wild west. You know, it's like a new frontier. You know, you had to come and find yourself, uh, you know, in the evenings you find these gunshots here, there. Bullets were kind of quite common here. After a few days, there's no gunshot, then you get worried. What is wrong now tonight? That was our reality of the situation in 1886. Mm -hmm. But in February 1986 is when NRM came to power and uh, there was an army which was disciplined and, you know, um, far more decent mm -hmm. people there. Doing things, enterprise, business opportunity. My, my cousins were in business, so of course uh, I wanted to see what I could do. It took six months for me uh, before I could decide what I wanted to do. So by de December 1986, January 87, I, that's when I rented my first shop. Oh. I started my first business. It was a, a shop which was selling beers, imported beers from Kenya. Because there was no local beer. There's no local beers and the factories had broken down and all the importation was from Kenya. White Camp was very similar to the Bell beer here and, and it, it, it was very popular. So this is what the majority of people drank at that time. Mm. I was not an importer. I would buy beers from people mm -hmm. uh, who are direct importers. And, and, and you see what would happen, the whole truckload would be about 1,200 crates of beer. And the guy would want to sell the whole consignment to me, but I did not have the money to buy the whole consignment. So I would give him 50% and then tell him, I'll come back after two days at four o'clock, your money will be there. So I made sure that whoever sold me the beers, the time, the time I gave them for repayment, they've come at, at that time, they pick up their money. So I, I, people started trusting me and that is how business started. And I can imagine, you know, people were really happy just to have a regular supply of beer. And was that dif difficult to get started? Or? Customers were there, but the importers needed somebody to do, to, do, to do their retail. So they come to us, offload the whole truck, we pay them 50% and, and then they will quickly use that money to go and buy more and buy they get, they, they got paid for the other half. So it worked very well and Within about three or four months, we were actually like the largest beer trader in, 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 in the country for, for three years. Well, I think what, what, what would happen is that after the first year of buying from importers, I also, you know, when I started my business, I had a capital of $25,000 with me. So after a while, I saved enough money and, and spare money to go and do my own importation. So I'll buy from my suppliers and I'll also import uh, to maximize my return on my investment. And then we would find that uh, our volumes of sales increase, we have uh, more clientele and we are very reliable. So most of the hotels and bars were buying from us on wholesale basis. In the, mean t in, in, in the same time, we used to have expatriate community who would come and buy my beer and he would then also sell his foreign currency that he needed for local shillings. So we'll buy his foreign currency because we need that foreign currency to go and buy the beers. So that is how. And then around 1990, the local brewery started producing, so importation stopped. And importation stopped, then what we had was connections with people who, was, who needed local shillings. Mm -hmm. So they would actually come and sell us their foreign currency and in the meantime, we did not have demand for it because importation of beer stopped. So that's how, then, then we ended up getting into Forex business in 1990. And within six months, we, we were doing more turnover than the banks in this country as, as for Forex and dealers. Mm. And then the banks created a cartel and, and that cartel was to maximize charges. So then we had no choice, but we had to then invention into banking. Oh, that's when you started Crane Bank. 1995. I see. 
in the meantime we started accumulating a lot of uh, buying a lot of properties and real estate it looks like you know it like one door opens and then another door opens and you, yes. you had or you also had that mindset of yes, making yes. the most you of have to think ahead of the game mm -hmm. even now yeah. we're doing different things and then you find it is um, now we we're in so many different businesses if I could just take you back a little bit, when you said you wanted to come back, what did people say to you? For me, once my mind is made up, it didn't matter what people said. I think it's more of a problem for my wife, who would work for a bank in England and she had a, uh, you know, she was a mid typical middle class uh, uh, conservative Indian family. How can you go to Africa now? And more of a problem, but once I was here, and of course then she has to follow. Uh, and, and see followed. Uh, and we made a life for ourselves, yeah. What would you say has been your secret to success? Basic art of doing business, understanding an opportunity, and making sure that if, if I give somebody my word, must keep it. It's a good old-fashioned way of doing things. And that is where we've succeeded a lot. We keep people our word. And whatever we would do, we'll honor it. Whether we made a profit or loss. And that has also helped us create our own reputation. I mean, all our businesses grew in every sector. We're in many sectors now. You know, we had a problem with the bank uh, where we, we just won a case in the Supreme Court. So we are in, in, in hotel business, we're in real estate, we're, which is the, the strength of a group. We're in education, we own three schools and a university. We're in floriculture, a bit of media business. Currently we employ eight and a half thousand people in the group. So what keeps you going? For me, is to say for example, you know, for real estate, I like to build up a, a project. We will start from inception of the concept to physical and start building the building and making sure it's finished. And then we see the all kinds of people who occupy it. By occupying our buildings, they're also creating opportunities for many Ugandans who get employed. That is our satisfaction to see a building that we build is, is occupied and it is operational. So what would you say is the reason for Indian businesses being successful? I think most business people who are successful are hardworking people and Indians are no exception worldwide. So it's not that they're successful only in Africa. They're su successful if you go to Europe, if you go to England and then if you go to America. Indians over the last 30-40 years have been so successful and they continue being successful. So aside from hard work? It's not only hard work but you also have the family values you, uh, you know, the, the, this part and parcel of your strength, you know, unlike some of my f friends where the son is cheating the father in his own business, I think we don't kind of have the kind of issue. If, if, if a child is in the business and he will, he will not take commissions f for doing his father's work, probably he will get a salary, mm -hmm. but that is how we work. So, you know, a lot of Indians have come back, they've put quite a lot, you know, a lot of work into getting the businesses going. And before, well, in 72, I think they controlled, what is it, 80, 90 percent of the economy. People are saying that, but a lot of the business was still managed and controlled by the multinationals, who were all British owned. The Asians controlled the manufacturing and the retail. And today, the retail business is 99% controlled by Ugandan, which is very good. However, 95% of manufacturing businesses is controlled by the Asians. The Asians in this country uh, are, are less than 0.001%. However, they're contributing over 60% of the corporation tax, in the, even today in this country.
Okay, and I was interested to hear about your motivation to start your foundation. One of the principles my wife keeps pushing all of us is to say that, look, this country has been good to us. It is our obligation. Mm -hmm. Even from being a Hindu, it's our, in our culture, you always give. We are successful in this country, and all the charities we do will only be in this country. And we support a lot of organizations here. Mm -hmm. Wildlife, um, orphanages, uh, school fees for so many children, bursaries. And how do you see the future of Uganda? <laughs> very, very bright. Because Uganda has a lot of oil. Oil companies are investing over $15 billion on refinery pipeline and extracting oil and exporting it. So you think that's going to be a big game changer? It is already a big game changer. For the ordinary Ugandan? Equally. It's wonderful you see a very bright future for Uganda. So as we commemorate the 50-year anniversary of the expulsion, I wonder, Sudhir, do you have any closing remarks or messages you, you wish to share? In August 4th, will be exactly 50 years when the President Idi Amin announced expulsion of the Asians. In the process, the Asians who left Uganda, have, wherever they've gone, they've, they have worked very hard. They've become very um, responsible citizens of that country, and they've equally contributed in those economies. And likewise, when when you, a country like Uganda who initially um, a few issues, but at the same time, we must also understand that this person killed over thousands of Ugandans mm -hmm. and nobody is thinking about them. Ugandans suffered as much as Asians did, but Ugandans suffered more than the Asians did. Yeah? We also, on, on, on the good side of it, that it created a vacuum for so many Ugandans to come out and become successful entrepreneurs. And today in Uganda, this economy is not is to say that you're Ugandan, you're failing in business. They'll say you're failing because you're not good, not because of the Asians or anybody. It is you as an entrepreneur have not been successful and you failed. It is because of that, not because of any other tribal. So today's economy is very mixed. The vast majority of successful business are Ugandans and everybody plays a role. So, so there's a good thing and a bad thing out of it. Thank you for listening. Do tune in for another episode of Expulsion at 50 coming soon on this channel. Till then, goodbye and keep safe. Thank you.